Hi, and welcome to this Oxford event. My name is Dane, Festival Director, and it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Natty Mark, or rather to be welcomed into Natty Mark's African Library uh, for this event today. Natty Mark, it's great to have you involved in the festival. Um, we've worked a few times before, uh, and of course it's Black History Month, so it's really uh, timely to be speaking about these two explorers, um, Aguiano and Henson. Um, so how about we just get straight on to talking yeah, about that? Right. Yeah. So tell me about, um, well, tell me about these guys. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first person we're going to, oh yeah, first of all, I have to say, uh, say a thank you to Dane and Cathy for inviting me to uh, contribute to the festival. And as we say, this is a Black History Month, so it's quite an act that we're going to be kind of focusing on these two Arctic explorers. Um, so the first person we're going to look at is um, Equiano, Oladell. Equiano. Okay. He was from the um, Igbo people. Now, the Igbo people live in, so if you think of uh, Nigeria, uh, up in the north, the main ethnicity is the uh, Hausa people. In the southwest, it's the uh, Yoruba, probably the most well known of the three major ethnicities. And in the southwest, we find the uh, Igbo people. Now, Igbo is the um, original term. The Europeans couldn't say that, so then it became Igbo, but um, Igbo is the actual kind of um, uh, original term. For me, they have produced some of the greatest art in Africa. Well, I think um, um, internationally. And one of their artists actually has an Oxford connection. Anyway, so this is Ben Edmonwu, who was seen as kind of one of the, the major figures of uh, modern art in Africa. So he came to study in uh, England at uh, Goldsmiths. And during the war, um, him and his fellow students were evacuated to here and they um, done some of their studies at Ruskin. So he has um, uh, an Oxford uh, connection, but he's one of the, the major figures in modern art, not just in uh, Africa, um, I'm talking globally, uh, painter, uh, sculptor, um, one of his kind of um, major pieces is that he sculpted the uh, present queen. So he was the first African to sculpt um, a member of the European royal family. So that's Ben uh, in one more. Another figure uh, from uh, Igbo is Oche Okeke. Now, if you like folklore, as I do, um, this is um, a book that he published and illustrated looking at Igbo folklore and when we look at folklore around the world there's always a central figure usually a trickster figure so amongst the uh, amongst the Ashanti it's uh, an ant the spider for the Igbo people it's Umbe the uh, tortoise so he also gave us Buddhism now when we think of art schools we tend to think of ones that are gen uh, generated by the Europeans such as uh, Cubism and Expressionism he gave us Buddhism which is um, an ancient form of art, which was uh, for the body and also for exterior house uh, decoration. He took it from that kind of setting and brought it into the modern setting and put it on a canvas. And through that, he gave us um, this art school, or this art movement called uh, Buddhism, okay? And if you're interested in art, especially Nigerian art, by this, this for me, this is the best book out there uh, on Nigerian art, past and present. It's going to cost you seventy pound, but that is the best seventy pound that you would have spent in a long time. The artists of Nigeria. Yeah. Great. So really rich history. Really rich history that um, Equiano came from. Amazing. I, uh, new for me. So okay. this is really great to be introduced to this uh, this heritage. So, so tell me a little bit about uh, Guiano and his history then. Okay, so he was um, enslaved when he was uh, 11, him and his sister, um, taken first to Barbados, then to Virginia, and then one of the people who purchased him, he stayed with him for uh, uh, eight years. And during that time, he learned to read and write, and that's how he was given the name Gustavus Vasa, which was named after a Swedish king. And that's the name that he used for the rest of his life, um, apart from when he wrote his um, best-selling 
um, autobiography. So yeah, he spent this time um, traversing the, the Caribbean, going back and forth to the um, uh, American ports. So we saw him um, uh, in uh, Jamaica, uh, uh, Grenada, St. Kitts, some of the uh, Dutch um, Caribbean islands, just um, all over. And then he was sold to um, a guy called King. So his first, um, so Pascal, the guy who gave him the name uh, Christopher Wasser, he was with him for eight years. He was a Royal Navy man. Um, then the guy that he went with after King, um, uh, a merchant. And King said to him, because like, as anyone who's enslaved, you know, freedom is, is, is kind of the objective. And he said to him, if you can raise 40 pounds, then I will give you your freedom. So he became this trusted um, slave and he was sent kind of trading on behalf of a king. And then three years on, um, while he was trading, he was also doing some kind of side trading for himself. And he managed to uh, amass this, this amount. So he was finally uh, given his uh, freedom for uh, 40 pound. And 40 pound obviously isn't 40 quid that we're used to today. That was yeah. a huge amount of yeah, money. Yeah, a huge amount of money, yeah. Back, yeah. You know, back uh, in the yeah, day, so yeah. to kind of be able to Put yeah, it all together is yeah, incredible. It shows kind of the uh, tenacity of spirit. Absolute, that they absolute have. tenacity. Yeah, and yeah. You know, a lot of yeah. Um, and 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 just and just like a yearning for freedom, which must yeah. kind of must kind of pulsate through every kind of moment of his life. Well, why should someone not be free? That's it. But you know, like that. there we go. That's yeah. unfortunately our history, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so he's travelled around a huge amount. Yeah. Amassed all of this capital to get himself out of yeah. um, chains. Yeah. How did he get involved in an Arctic mission? Okay, he was working for a guy called Dr. Charles Irving. I think his original appointment was as a hairdresser. Um, but then Irving developed this um, instrument for purifying water. So when Phipps um, put together this um, Arctic expedition in 1773, um, Irving uh, came along because one, he wanted to test his device and also, they obviously wanted to be able to drink um, uh, clean water on, on their journey. So there was this kind of symbiotic um, reasoning behind having um, Irving on board. And obviously, having Irving on board, he's going to take his assistant with him. So that's how um, Equiano became a part of the uh, expedition. Okay. I'm sure they, I would like to think that they had a good camaraderie as well. Do you have any... Yeah. In insight into their um, relationship? Or? As far as I know, I've, um, as far as I know, um, it was a respectful one. Um, I haven't come across any kind of statement where um, Equiana said anything derogatory about him and, and vice versa. So as far as I know, it was a respectful relationship. I'm sure the relationship was strained in some way because of the circumstances, but you can still respect despite being... Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, it wasn't a slave then. I mean, yeah. kind of, you know, he'd, he'd uh, bought, bought his freedom he was a, a, a free man, so he was just another employee on the uh, another regular journey, guy on the journey. Yeah, yeah, another regular yeah, guy. Yeah. And so the the journey began. You said in seventeen seventy three. Yeah, so, yeah. Where did it leave from? Okay, so left from uh, Deptford, um, went out by uh, Sheerness, out out into the North Sea, um, north to the uh, Shetland Isles, and then from there into the Arctic regions. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that was pretty much the journey. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, 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 on a small boat. I, you know, I don't know if you've been on the boat, but I sometimes feel very seasick. Yeah. I can imagine the conditions were not the same as a luxury cruise. No. no, no, no. <laughs> uh, but so when they arrived, they probably were encountered by, or they encountered this terrain, mm -hmm. pretty cold, mm -hmm. um, unusual. They didn't know what was there. Yeah. Animals, maybe. So yeah, can you tell sure. me something about the terrain or what they okay. encountered when they got there? So they, um, from uh, the Shetland Isles, they went up via um, um, past Greenland. And the furthest they got was uh, Spitsbergen, which is the largest island um, of the Svalbard archipelago. And this is in the region of northern uh, Norway. So that is as far as they got. And you asked there about some of the uh, animals. Let me just read uh, an excerpt from um, Equiano's writings. On 28th of June, being in latitude 78, we made Greenland, where I was surprised to see the sun did not set. 
The weather now became extremely cold. And as we sailed between north and east, which was our course, we saw many very high and curious mountains of ice and also a great number of very large whales, which used to come close to our ship and blow the water up to a very great height in the air. One morning we had vast quantities of seahorses about the ship, which neighed exactly like any other horses. We fired some harpoon guns amongst them in order to take some, but we could not get any. And, and it was during this um, journey that, because um, there were two ships that went out, one was called the Carcass and one was called the Racehorse. And on one of the ships was um, Nelson, uh, Horatio Nelson. Um, and he was only about 14 or 15 um, um, at the time. Um, just starting out his career in the uh, Navy. And he actually had an altercation with a polar bear, um, which he was lucky to uh, survive. So you can see how kind of traumatic it was. And just to say uh, more about the um, uh, animals there, because we just mentioned whales and the horses. So I just want to mention something about um, what he says about uh, the polar bears. On 29th and 30th of July, we saw one continued plane of smooth and broken ice, bounded only by the horizon. And we fastened to a piece of ice that was eight yards, 11 inches thick. We had generally sunshine and constant daylight, which gave cheerfulness and novelty to the whole of this striking, grand and uncommon scene. And to heighten it still more, the reflection of the sun from the ice gave the clouds a most beautiful appearance. We killed many different animals at this time, and among the rest, nine bears. Though they had nothing in their pouches but water, yet they were all very fat. We used to decoy them to the ship sometimes by burning feathers or skins. I thought them coarse eating, but some of the ship's company relished them very much. So that's what they used to survive on. Yeah. I mean, uh, they took on food like um, musk and rabbit and uh, such things, but obviously, yeah, they obviously had the uh, live, well. live yeah. um, uh, stuff that they caught with their harpoons. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, that, yeah. so, sounds incredible, mm -hmm. but it sounds such a beautiful, you yeah. know, the, you sort of sometimes see photographs of you of the sort of polar regions, That's and the, the colours are incredible, yeah. and mm -hmm. the landscape must be so majestic. Yeah. yeah, and to be able to kind of go to this alien world almost yeah, yeah, you know yeah. from where you've kind of lived in England or you've, yeah. you've travelled around um, different kind of islands and yeah. you've spent quite a substantial part of your life on a boat yeah you know kind of travelling around and to see somewhere that's so new yeah. and explore it for the first time uh to sort of be the first person yeah. to see it and be in this space awesome. must have been incredible okay. um okay so how does how does he conclude his journey then does it tell you in his book um how things go on or yeah um he concludes by saying, From thence we sailed for London and on the 30th came up to Deptford and thus ended our Arctic voyage to the no small joy of all on board after having been absent four months, in which time, at the imminent hazard of our lives, we explored nearly as far towards the poles 81 degrees north and 20 degrees east longitude, being much further by all accounts than any navigator had ever ventured before, in which we fully proved the, impractic the impracticability of finding a passage that way to India. Because that was the objective of trying to find a, um, a passage through to uh, Asia, mm -hmm. um, had it been found then. Because um, remember, kind of spices was the thing, and kind of rather having to deal with the uh, middleman, they wanted to find the source of the uh, spices. So that was one reason, uh, one reason why they were so kind of intent on finding that route to uh, Asia. Uh, yeah. Trade routes. Yeah, trade, yeah, basically. Yeah. Uh, it sounds a, a sort of magical and exotic just finding yeah. the North Pole or a part, but there was a commercial reason at the end of the day. Oh yeah, for sure. And this was about yeah. business. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, this guy was an employee on a business trip, um, but he was encountering all of this um, yeah, for sure. health and safety issues. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. Like polar bears. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it sounds like he had an incredible, incredible life. Um, do you know what he did after this voyage? Yeah, can I, um, 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 uh, can I just read uh, one piece where he comes kind of close to death and it's kind of 
Well, back in there, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah just, and, then, and, then, and, then, and then I'll say something about what he's done uh, in his later life. Right? Um, okay, this is a, a, a longer piece, but it's quite important because it shows kind of the risks that, 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 that were taken in such journeys. We remained hereabouts until 1st of August, when the two ships got completely fastened in the ice, occasioned by the loose ice that set in from the sea. This made our situation very dreadful and alarming, so that on the seventh day, we were in very great apprehension of having the ship squeezed to pieces. The officers now held a council to know what was best for us to do in order to save our lives, and determined that we should endeavour to escape by dragging our boats along the ice towards the sea, which, however, was farther off than any of us thought. This determination filled us with extreme dejection and confounded us with despair. We had very little prospect of escaping with life. However, we saw some of the ice about the ships to keep it from hurting them and thus kept them in a kind of pond. We then began to drag the boats as well as we could towards the sea. But after two or three days labor, we made very little progress so that some of our hearts totally failed us. And I really began to give up myself for lost when I saw our surrounding calamities. While we were at this hard labor, I once fell into a pond we had made amongst some loose ice and was very near being drowned. But some people were near who gave me immediate assistance and thereby I escaped drowning. Our deplorable condition, which kept up the constant apprehension of our perishing in the ice, brought me gradually to think of eternity in such a manner as I've never done before. I had the fears of death hourly upon me and shuddered at the thoughts of meeting the grim king of terrors in the natural state I then was in, and was exceedingly doubtful of happy eternity if I should die in it. I had no hopes of my life being prolonged for any time, for we saw that our existence could not be long on the ice after leaving the ships, which are now out of sight and some miles from the boats. Our appearance now became truly lamentable. Pale dejection seized every countenance. Many who had been before blasphemers, in this our distress, began to call on the good God of heaven for his help. And in a time of our utter need, he heard us, and against hope, our human probability delivered us. Wow. So that was quite a harrowing yeah. experience. You can feel that. Hey. You can feel that. <laughs> of, I'm just about, this isn't going to, I'm not going to uh, get out of this. That's it. Please, that's God, it. help me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he gets it like, this, this is just someone's work. Yeah. <laughs> like, this is an experience that someone's going through and the boat being almost crushed and hit. Like, it must have been so frightening. Um, Very. But he got back. He got back. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. This is yeah, incredible. Yeah. Like this guy's journey so far. He's started his life out in enslavement. He's managed yeah. to get out of it. He's yeah. on a work trip. Yeah, yeah. He goes to the Arctic. He almost dies. He's polar bears, yeah. and he gets home. Yeah. Amazing. Okay. Amazing. What happened? What What did he do later on in his life? Okay. Uh, when he came back, he got involved in the um, movement for the ending of uh, slavery. Um, when we think about the, um, the activists would tend to think about the Quakers and um, people like Wilberforce and, you know, Thomas Clarkson and uh, Granville Sharp. There's actually a group which he was a leader in called the Sons of Africa. Um, I think maybe about 10 or a dozen guys came together. Most had been formerly enslaved. Um, they'd learned to read and write. And so they put together this kind of group called the Sons of Africa, which is probably the first um, black political organization in this country in the latter part of the uh, 18th century. So they've done things like um, wrote letters to um, the newspapers, um, petitions, um, um, speaking engagements, uh, lectures. So when we think about the fight against slavery in this country, as well as thinking about the work that the Quakers done and people like Wilberforce, we need to also uh, introduced the work that the sons of uh, Africa did. So um, he was a part of this. He wrote um, um, a bestseller. So this is a shortened version of it. Um, and this bestseller um, made him rich. Um, and he married um, an English woman, had uh, some children, I think two children. Um, yeah, and just basically just uh, continued with the fight against the slavery. And equal rights. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
an incredible story and the way he's pulls his you know pull his life up from a really by the bootstraps yeah, if you yeah, like yeah. just going to take this one on yeah. and he's seen how life can be if you're not in enslavement That's and as we say you know who wants who wants to be subjugated yeah. by that yeah. and then he wants to help other people That's to go it. there's a better way yeah we don't need to be like this yeah. let's all be equal yeah uh, an incredible like, and no wonder it was a bestseller like yeah. listen to the stories sure. that are in the book yeah you yeah know, yeah he's got yeah. everything yeah, yeah. yeah. travels yeah. i mean because because he, he talks about kind of his travels um he almost died on a previous journey when he was um in the bahamas the ship uh got um suffered a shipwreck and he almost died there so, I mean, there's this life of kind of ups and downs all through his life. Yeah. And waiting for Hollywood, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next up, we've got another explorer, uh, okay. Matthew Henson. Matthew right? Henson. Um, so, he was involved in another Arctic adventure, yeah. right? Can you okay. tell me a bit about Matthew? Yeah, sure. And his travel? Sure. So, Matthew Henson, um, African American. Um, he was born the year after the Civil War ended. And this is when they founded um, the historically, um, the black um, historic universities such as um, Howard, um, Spellman, Fisk, Morehouse, where Martin Luther King studied. Now, in another setting, he would have gone to one of these universities for sure, because the intelligence that he showed throughout his life he would definitely have gone to one of these used universities and got a degree. But he was orphaned um, as a child and looking after himself and ended up going to, to sea as a, as a 12 year old. So there was Oladel Oquiano who went to sea when he was 11, but he was kind of enforced. Whereas um, Henson took that as a decision. He said kind of, hey, uh, there's nothing here for me really, so let me try uh, life at sea. So he um, goes to sea, spends time there, um, traversing the oceans for a few years, and then um, come back to America, um, and he's working as a shop assistant for a, a furrier. And one day, uh, Perry comes in, and they get chatting, blah, 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 and... Perry uh, um, takes him on as his uh, assistant and they go off uh, traveling um, Nicaragua and such places um, and then in the late 1890s they made the first of their eight journeys Arctic uh, um, Arctic journeys um, over 18 years they, they uh, took these journeys. Um, and the one that actually saw them reach the pole was a 1908, 1909, 1908, 1909 um, expedition. So a little bit after Equiano's journey. Yeah, for sure. Journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, this is not a luxury cruise. <laughs> no. <laughs> so what was, can you tell me a bit of the conditions on the boat when he was there or, you know, yeah, was it kind of, clean, was it, comfortable in any way kind of um so this is a book that he wrote um in 1912 there was a later um autobiography which came out in 1947 but this one he wrote in 1912 specifically about the um arctic journey and in this one he talks about um, when we talk about conditions on the boat um let me read one here where he talks about the hygiene um Our heavy furs had been made by the Eskimo women on board the ship and had been thoroughly aired and carefully packed on the sledges. We were to discard our old clothes before leaving the land and endeavour to be in the cleanest condition possible while contending with the ice, for we knew that we would get dirty enough without having the discomfort of vermin added. It is easy to become vermin infested and when all forms of life but man and dog seem to have disappeared, the bed bug still remains. Each person had taken a good bath with plenty of soap and water before we left the ship. And we had given each other what we call a prize fighter's haircut. We ran the clippers from forehead back all over the head and we looked like a precious bunch. We had hair enough on our heads by the time we came back from our three months journey and we needed a few more baths 
and more new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Double showers. Then. Double showers. <laughs> Well, that sounds grim. It vermin. does sound grim vermin. because we all because because when I think of vermin, I tend to think all oh, insects and kind of and their kind of well, you know, the kind of the the tragedies they bring. I tend to think of it more kind of hot countries, uh, humid countries. Cockroaches. I wouldn't, I, yeah, I want to fall a bit so much in the Arctic, but there we have it. I suppose you know these creatures well, are, we'll get everywhere, get everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But rats, you know, like, you know, like how do they get on the boat and then they can't hey. get rid of them? Hey. Oh, bed bugs, that's nasty. Um, so even though there's vermin, it must have been pretty cold, cold, as well, cold right? So this, I can't imagine it being you know comfortable. I mean, looking at the outfit of this guy, yeah, you know, a big kind of fur parka, yeah, big yeah, fur yeah, parka, yeah, you know. So there must you know, any problems with frostbite? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's um, yeah. I mean, frostbite is is, is going to hit um, anyone going yeah. to those regions. But he says here, and this is quite telling about the way they kind of um, counteract it. Easy wind. Clear sky, but awful cold. Going across Clements Markham Inlet was fine, and we were able to steal a ride on the sledges most of the way. But we all had our faces frosted, and my short, flat nose, which does not readily succumb to the cold, suffered as much as did Macmillan's. Even these men of iron, the Eskimos, suffered from the cold, Uta freezing the great toe of his right foot. Perforce, he was compelled to thaw it out in the usual way. That is, taking off his kamik and placed his frozen foot under my bearskin shirt, the heat of my body thawing out the frozen member. So that's quite drastic, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Kind of that your 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 toe is kind of frostbitten, and the only way that you can counteract that is to put it in the kind that's of someone else's jumper. Yeah, 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 yeah. So well, it must have uh, been survival. So, yeah, uh, like, and but man will survive. You know, kind of we have this kind of ingenious ways of surviving and kind of, and him and uh, Perry throughout the kind of, cause it was about 18 years they spent uh, traversing the, the Arctic and they'd learned skills from the uh, Inuit. I mean, he calls them uh, Eskimos there, but then the more respectful term now is uh, Inuit. So he learned all these survival skills from the Inuit. He also learned their language. Uh -huh. um, so able, uh, uh, better able to um, uh, communicate. So kind of, through learning them survival skills, basically they, they were able to survive. Some tips, yeah. some yeah. tips on how to kind yeah. of, you know, and we hear from uh, Equiano, they kind of, they must have learned some things from other people who have been traveling. And yeah, for sure. Just, so yeah. obviously yeah. the Inuits are a bit more acclimatized. Yeah, for so sure. They might have some tricks. Yeah, for sure. And ways yeah, to kind yeah, of get, yeah, yeah. but if you're from, you know, a much warmer country, yeah. you know, and we, you know, even England or yeah, you know, yeah. to yeah. North America, it's warmer, yeah. right? So you, you're just not as used to it. But That's it. if you can learn a few ticks and trips from, from those that know the indigenous yeah, yeah, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, and don't forget, some of this weather was kind of minus sixty-five. Can you imagine that? Oh, I can't imagine that. No, that's, <laughs> you know, we we're doing some liquid nitrogen demonstrations the other day. That's minus minus seventy something. It's yeah. like it is cold. cold. <laughs> <laughs> it is cold. And if your toe gets frostbitten. Oh. And then you want to fix that straight yeah, away. So yeah. that's no. You mentioned um, something about sleighs, uh, dog sleighs. Yeah, say. yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, the dogs were kind of. When you think of the, uh, the the Sahara, and the importance of camels to the trade that left Sidra Massa, Morocco, and came to Timbuktu, Mali, the importance of the put the importance of camels to that trade, the same importance that the dogs had. To the uh, to the uh, movement in the uh, Arctic, and here um, he he makes a beautiful um, statement uh, about that about the uh, the uh, paramountcy of the dogs. Um, next to the Eskimos, the dogs are the most interesting subjects in the Arctic regions, and I could tell lots of tales to prove their intelligence. These animals, more wolf than dog have associated themselves with human beings of this country as have their kin in more congenial places of the earth. Wide head, sharp nose and pointed ears, thick wiry hair, and in some of the males, a heavy mane. Thick bushy tail curved up over the back, deep chest and forelegs wide apart. A typical Eskimo dog is the picture of alert attention. They are as intelligent as any dog in civilization and a thousand times more useful. They earn their own livings and disdain any other comforts of life. Indeed, 
it seems that when life is made pleasant for them, they get sick, lie down and die. And when out on the march with no food for days, thin gaunt skeletons of their former selves, they will drag at the traces of their sledges and by their uncomplaining conduct, inspire the human companions to keep on. Without the Eskimo dog, the story of the North Pole would remain untold. For human talent has not yet devised any other means to overcome the obstacles of cold, storm and ice that nature has placed in the way than those that were utilized on this expedition. You know, kind of, it wouldn't have happened without the dogs, basically. Just, just, just like the uh, the trade across the Sahara wouldn't mm. have happened without the camels. The engine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, you know, but even a car wouldn't work. You know, That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I misspoke. I said Nick and Rajna meant dry ice. Mm. So I think dry ice um, freezes mm. or carbon dioxide freezes yeah. at minus seventy eight degrees Celsius. Okay. And you're saying it's around minus sixty 65. degrees. Yeah, sixty five. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Like we're on the edge of air being what air is. Um, you know, this is cold, and for the dogs to be able to survive, I mean, they've not. You know, they might have an additional bit of layering on uh, them, yeah. but their feet are on the ground. The dogs' toes are on the ground. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so when we're talking about frostbite, yeah. everything is just so difficult to manage yeah, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, in these yeah. hostile conditions. Um, so it's incredible that they could even get around, <laughs> uh, and it was lucky that they had dogs and things. Um, so. It, Sounds like part of the adventure. Mm. It sounds like, you know, who would want to go to this inhospitable mm. place, despite it maybe looking beautiful and it, having the prospect of maybe opening up a new trade route. Mm. But still, there's the adventure part of it and people want to get to the North Pole. Yeah. yeah. Um, how did you get on with that? Um, he was quite, I think, from his early life when he'd had to kind of fend for himself and kind of and his years at sea and, and kind of just this level of independence. I think he'd built up this kind of wealth of tenacity in, in, in inside him. And from what he'd learned from the Inuits, because don't forget, he actually kind of, he actually had an Inuit partner and his only child he had was through an Inuit woman. Mm -hmm. So kind of from his own personal uh, uh, tenacity and from the skills that he'd learned, I think he kind of, got through okay there 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 was one kind of moment kind of i'm not going to read this because um this is probably the only kind of time when he shows some kind of kind of um discouragement um this from my diary eight days out and not a shot not a sight of game nothing the night is coming quickly the long months of darkness of quiet and cold that in spite of my years of experience, I can never get used to. And up here at Sheridan, it comes sooner and lasts longer than it does at Etta and Bowden Bay. Only a few days difference, but it is longer and I do not welcome it. Not a sound, except the report of a glacier broken off by its weight and causing a new iceberg to be born. The black darkness of the sky, the stars twinkling above, and hour after hour after hour, going by with no sunlight. Every now and then the moon, when storms do not come, and always the cold, getting colder and colder, and me out on the hunt for fresh meat. I know it, the so old story, a man's work and a dog's life. And what does it amount to? What good is to be done? I am tired, sick, sore, and discouraged. And that's the only kind of time that you really through 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 um, and through the whole reporting. That's the only time that you really kind of you get a kind of an indication of the the depths of a uh, despair. Yeah, filling yeah. it down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but that was if that's the only period that we've got in record that he's sort of beginning to kind of lose it and think yeah. oh, it's time to get you know. Yeah. Um, did he? He must have had an upswing after that um, to kind of write this to kind of. Yeah, write, yeah. I mean. It, he was a man who I think who who was just going to keep uh, uh, keep going. I mean, he was someone who was kind of um, expert dog handler, mm -hmm. um, sledge maker. Perry said that he couldn't have done this without Henson. Perry actually said that although things got a kind of bit cold between them later on, kind of he actually admitted that he couldn't have done this journey without um, without Henson. But maybe. 
was airbrushed out of the story. No, he was, yeah, yeah. Story. He was, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. By, yeah. By both of these characters, you know, I'd not heard of them. Yeah. Or we might have heard of Scott of the Antarctic. Yeah, that's how, you know, we yeah, heard yeah. of some of the Shackleton explorers. Yeah, that's explorers. It. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but these guys that were fundamental yeah. to the success of some For of sure. these I mean, kind of, um, uh, Epcano, he was there to assist um, Irving with the, um, you know, with the purification of the water. And, and collecting certain specimens. So he was just another kind of employee, so to speak, whereas Henson was integral to that, um, to the, the, the expedition that he, that he took part in. He was a central figure, you know, the senior, to, senior staff. Kind of yes, yeah, yeah, kind of, he's, he's uh, Perry's right-hand man, basically. Yeah, yeah. But still, didn't get as much. No, he didn't get the uh, un, until um, later life. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to read, if I could just read um, something that he says here about, because um, I mentioned just now that he was kind of this. Um, so um, in um, in his years at sea, as well as learning to read and write, he'd also learned skills like carpentry. Mm -hmm. So he built all the um, sledges and kind of, I just want to read this bit because. Um, when I was younger, I worked on um, building sites and kind of, you know, you, you, you're working away during the winter and kind of you'll strip off layer, you'll strip off layers. Because you're hot. You, 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 <laughs> yeah. But your the feet, my feet never got warm. You know, I had boots on and two pairs of socks, but my feet never got warm. Um, so when I read this, I think to myself how he could have done this work out like the cold repairing sledges, he says, Number one, said I to myself, and I came to a halt. The gale was still blowing, but I started to work on the necessary repairs. I practically built one sledge out of two broken ones, while out on the ice and in weather almost as bad as this. And I have almost daily during the journey had to repair broken sledges, sometimes under fiercer conditions. So I will describe this one job and hereafter, when writing about report, repairing a sledge, let it go at that. Cold and windy, undo the lashings, unload the load, get out the brace and bit and bore new holes, taking plenty of time, for in such cold there is danger of the steel bit breaking. Then, with ungloved hands, thread the sealskin thongs through the hole, the fingers freeze. Stop work, pull the hand through the sleeve and take your icy fingers to your heart. That is, put your hand under your armpit. And when you feel it burning, you know it has thawed out, then start to work again. Oh, you know, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine that. You know, kind of, yeah, that just that just kills me. That one does. I mean, yeah, people yeah. might have familiarity of, you know, maybe they've not been working in cold temperatures, but uh, people may have had snowball fights, right? Yeah, yeah. And even when you're kind of having a snowball fight, yeah, and your hands are getting cold, that's it. That's and you stop feeling your hands, yeah, and that's only just, you know moderately yeah, cold snow. Yeah, yeah. And then you kind of warm it up and you kind of get that tingling sensation. Yeah. yeah. But working at minus 40, 50, it, 60 degrees. That's it. Intricate work. That's it. Having to take your gloves off yeah. and having to I mean that must have just been too much. That's survival. <laughs> it's survival. <laughs> really. That is survival. It's like, got survival. a job to get done. Hey. And that's as you say, tenacity, I yeah. think, isn't it? Yeah. Getting this work done. Yeah. But the amount of um of energy that these guys put into exploration yeah. uh, uh, under the most harsh conditions. I mean, even now, further exploration is not easy, yeah. but there's neoprene yeah. and there's kind of insulated and yeah. there's kind of, you know, there's all the there's sport so much, vehicles, yeah, and helicopters, and phones, yeah, yeah, and yeah, all these yeah, things. Yeah. When you're out there in the middle of nowhere, it's just you and it's yeah, just yeah, you, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. and if this doesn't work, yeah. I mean, we kind of just coming back to Equiano's kind of yeah. prayer to yeah. God, don't take That's me, it. I'm not ready yeah, to go. Yeah. Don't let me, you know, and almost giving up. And even, you know, uh, this this story of like just um, being a bit down in the dumps is like, oh, this is a bit over, you know. Yeah. But still, kind of having to kind of get through, yeah, yeah, and yeah. kind of yeah, fix these. There, things there's no, things there's no time to fester. No, there's no, no time to sit and wallow and feel. So sort of, there's work to be done. You know, you need to get out of these situations. So plow on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's sort of what can we learn from these people? in challenging circumstances where it is just flow on. Yeah, I mean, just regurgitate these stories, you know, kind of when we face certain situations 
and we feel a bit kind of despondent, just kind of remember these stories, just keep them, just keep, I mean, that's why I've got all these uh, pictures on, on uh, my wall, you know, these are sources of uh, inspiration because these stories are much harder than whatever, whatever I'm going through now. The, str yeah. the struggle, the struggle, the struggle, yeah, the struggle that, sure. you know, having yeah. the context of slavery, yeah. of yeah. not being respected, that's it. not even sometimes by some people being considered as a human being, yeah. 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 you know, yeah. these people are just dreadful circumstances. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, now where obviously things aren't great, mm -hmm. you know, we're still kind of seeing, you know, people disrespecting. Yeah, we're being, still back being with cruel, uh, uh, racism and, and um, but what these people went through, uh, it's, they just could they 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 just continue to inspire me that's unthinkable yeah, yeah, that's yeah. unthinkable yeah so what did you do later in his life coming back to um, nothing could, could i could like could i just read one more uh, piece that he says it because okay. kind of, okay. um, one of his um colleagues um um passed on so i just want to read um what he says about that because this must be something that was always looming um you know the the possibility of death um because of the conditions. March 27th, I was attained the trail at 6 a.m. But before starting, I went over to Marvin's igloo, igloo to bid him goodbye. In his quiet, earnest manner, he advised me to keep on and hope for our success. He congratulated me and we gave each other the strong fraternal grip of our honored fraternity. And we confidently expected to see each other again at the ship. My good, kind friend was never again to see us or talk with us. It is sad to write this. He went back to his death, drowned in the cold black water of the big lead. In unmarked, unmarbled grave, he sleeps his last long sleep. So that was kind of just, you know, kind of about the kind of, you know, the ever present possibility of someone succumbing because of all the uh, conditions. Um, and I just want to read one more where he talks about, because you think to yourself, you know, thirst shouldn't be kind of an issue because they're surrounded by ice and water, but it's what he says. You have undoubtedly taken into consideration the pangs of hunger and of cold that you know assailed us going forward. But have you ever considered that we were thirsty for water to drink or hungry for fat? To eat snow to quench our thirsts, would have been the height of folly. And as well as being thirsty, we were continuously assailed by the pangs of our hunger that called for the fat, good, rich, oily, juicy fat that our systems craved and demanded. Had we succumbed to the temptations of thirst and eaten the snow, we would not be able to tell the tale of the conquest of the pole, for the result of eating snow is death. True, the dogs licked up enough moisture to quench their thirst, but we were not made of such stern stuff as they. Snow would have reduced our temperatures and we would quickly have fallen by the way. We had to wait until camp was made and the fire of alcohol started before we had a chance. And it was with hot tea that we quenched our thirst. The hunger for fat was not appeased. A dog or two was killed, but his carcass went to the Eskimos and the entrails were fed to the rest of the pack. We ate no dogs on this trip for various reasons, mainly that the eating of dog is only a last resort and we have plenty of food, and raw dog is flavourless and very tough. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite a last resort. That is a last resort, isn't it? <laughs> That's, uh, I like the fires of alcohols and yeah. hot tea. That sounds yeah. nice, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, just, uh, again, the conditions, incredible, yeah. you know, exploring. Um, but he survived. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, he survived. Yeah, well, yeah, uh, yeah. And and you know all of these kind of experiences, mm. character building. Right? Yeah, for sure. You know, to yeah, kind of yeah, go, yeah. holy, we got through that one. Yeah, I'm going to get through this next thing uh, a little bit more easily um, because I've had so many more experiences. Mm. So, what did he do later in life then? Okay, so he came back. He was somewhat shunned by Perry. Um, do you know why? Well. Um, they both had this thing about who who was the first one to actually touch the pole. Is um, this the Neil Armstrong Buzz Aldrin situation? Yeah, it's that kind of yeah. thing, yeah. And, 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 and it shouldn't have been really. These two had spent so much time together, years and years working, you know, in kind of 
in the jungles of um, Central America, in, in, in the Arctic waste on these eight journeys. They threw but, it together then. Yeah, together, yeah. But he came back and, and basically kind of shunned him. Now, um, Henson thinks that he got there first because he was in the lead, the, the lead sledge. And they had shot the kind of the point where they put the flag by, I think, I think he said a couple of miles. But when he came back the following day, he saw that his footprints were there. So he, you know, he was the first one there. But anyway, they had this kind of um, this kind of the rivalry. Yeah, uh, between them. And then when he came back, he didn't give him the true kind of um, respect that he should have um, been given. Um, he was celebrated within the black community, but in the wider community. They, at that time, they couldn't accept that a black man could have kind of achieved this monumental feat. Mm -hmm. So for this reason, he was kind of shunned, her, basically. And it wasn't until his later life, starting in the kind of late 30s, that he was given kind of the accolades that he should have been given back in 1909. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, geographical societies kind of um, kind of brazed him and um, was invited to the White House by Eisenhower and um, I can't remember who the other president was. But yeah, so in later in life, he was given his due, but would have been much sweeter if it had been given to him at the time that it was given to Perry. Right, so yeah. again, sort of having to fight for everything and That's waiting. It. Yeah. And yeah. Like, why yeah. why yeah. is it not just ready? Why yeah. do you have to kind of make it so difficult to That's decide? Um, but he, he got recognised. Yeah, in later life, yeah. I mean, the... The, uh, the uh, black community that they're, they're celebrating, because I remember he's written this in 1912, mm -hmm. but the wider community, that didn't happen until um, starting in the late 30s. So where did he move back to then? The yeah, um, um, I went back to America, I think it was, uh, Washington, and he worked as a clerk in, in a customs house. Mm -hmm. um, so while Perry was going, um, was going around the world being celebrated by everyone, he was just kind of this clerk in this um, customs house. Mm -hmm. yeah. Even though it would never have happened without that's uh, it without him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, another example of people who are fundamental to discovery yeah. being forgotten about. That's it. I'll in, give them a convenient yeah. um, bit of history there. Yeah. Um, right. Well, uh, I mean, the two similar, not not the same, but similar kind of tracks of. You know, they've been fighting the good fight and exploring, but yeah. still not always being recognised. Recognised, that's it. And, yeah. you know, if we could bring this up to date, what can you kind of, what parallels can you draw with um, contemporary society, people not being recognised? Um, well, I think, I think, I think uh, the reason why we have a Black History Month shows the continuing non-recognition, because if this subject matter, then other Black heroes and heroines were taught in the mainstream curriculum, then we wouldn't have, we wouldn't need to have Black History Month. Mm -hmm. So that con, that, that, um, the saga of non-recognition uh, continues to the present day. Mm. That's too true. Yeah. But, um, so we've got, we got some time for questions. If, um, if you want to drop a question in the Q&A box and we can uh, ask it to Natty Mark and we can find out um, if it's about explorers and, the journeys of uh, uh, Equiano and Henson, or anything actually about uh, Black History Month that you'd like to ask. Uh, we've got uh, 10 or so minutes uh, that we can follow, but I'm just really interested in kind of hearing uh, more of these kind of historical kind of stories. I mean, looking around mm -hmm. the African school here, there's so many um, examples of struggle mm -hmm. and you know, people that we, so there are some places that I sort of recognize. Yeah. Which ones, are, which ones are recognised? Well, it's sort of, uh, I think this one over here. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to get my glasses on. Oh, what, uh, <laughs> what, uh, the guy nearest to us with his. On this, on the on the ball, on this one, next to the, is it the red pitch, the banjo? Okay, okay. Okay, yeah, uh, Claude uh, McKay. Oh, no. That's that, that's, yeah. So, so who's this? So he was um, one of the uh, writers and he came to prominence during what we know as the Harlem Renaissance. Okay. Which was this great um, outpouring of uh, expression through art in the early part of the uh, 20th century, all part of what was called the New Negro Movement. Um, so he was a, a novelist and, and poet. Right. Because because when, when we talk about Renaissance, we tend to talk about the Italian one, yeah. Yeah, Michelangelo and so forth. Yeah. It's very rare that we hear the Harlem Renaissance being uh, mentioned. And this was happening in the early part of the 20th century. And, you know, plays 
um, poetry, uh, um, journalism, sculpture, paintings, everything came out. Um, just that period. And some, I don't think it was that person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, but this is the Holland, this is Holland in the North America. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so at, at, at that time, that was seen as kind of like the uh, mecca of um, African America. Research, and yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the culture there. Um, we, but we did have a question coming in the box. We will put the uh, the authors uh, the the book titles uh, uh, online when we finished. Uh, some people are keen to kind of read these, okay, um, or get hold of copies of them, okay. Uh, so we'll do that. Um, but just these, when I mean, we hear a lot about the kind of African American experience, um, and so you've chosen to have one example of uh, a British African, you know. A British black guy and an American black guy, and I thought I recognised an African American guy, but I was mistaken. Um, we hear so much about African American experience, yeah. but the yeah. black British experience okay. um, doesn't always seem to get as much airtime. Okay. Um, well, okay. Well, one person we should mention is a guy called Harold Moody. So, born in Jamaica, but he came here and studied and became a, a, a doctor. Um, when he finished his studies at King's College, he was refused due to, due to racism, he was refused work in hospitals. So he set up his own uh, private practice in Peckham, which became very successful. And one of the beautiful things about him is that, don't forget, this was um, in the late 20s, 30s before the NHS. Mm -hmm. And he was known to treat anyone, even um, the poorest person who didn't have uh, the money to pay for treatment. He was known to um, just treat anyone. So people could come off the street um, from any of the slum areas and and he would treat them, which I think is um, a beautiful thing. And when we talk about the civil rights movement, we tend to focus more on America you know, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks. Mm -hmm. But Martin Luther King started his campaign in the 50s. In 1931, he set up something called the League of Current Peoples, mm -hmm. which was the first major civil rights org um, organization in this country. Had its journal called The Keys, People like Joma Kenyatta, first leader of independent Kenya, um, um, Una Marson, the first um, black woman to broadcast on the BBC. All these people were involved in that organisation. So when we think about civil rights, mm -hmm. we should think about this country as well and Harold Moody and setting up the um, League of Coloured Peoples in 1931. Mm. So I think we sometimes... It's almost easy to forget yeah. or allow ourselves to kind of think of the American experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's been so many you know, efforts in this country yeah, to make sure. things more equal. For sure. And I mean, one of the things that he'd done was kind of was kind of dismantle the colour bar to a certain extent so black people could join up in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So people were willing to fight. Yeah. And yeah. They involved. Yeah. But it turns out they weren't allowed to. Uh, doesn't make any yes, sense. Uh, yeah, it? yeah. yeah we've already seen examples of yeah. huge tenacity, skill, yeah, yeah, and you know, and just ability to kind of do things in, you know, Equiano and to carry on. And yeah. to carry on. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. see, but even even the example of Equiano to, to go to try and end enslavement yeah. and try and kind of sort out kind of civil rights, but these people aren't getting the airtime right. that they deserve. So that's why I'm glad with, with the science festival, you've given me the opportunity so I can put their names out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now people, when they talk about Arctic exploration, they've got to mention Equiano and Henson alongside Amundsen and Scott and whoever. Yeah, yeah. we're just exploring geography, we're exploring history, social yes. history, yeah. uh, and even contemporary society. Yeah, you know, for sure. This journey has still not been finished. There's no. still a lot more to do. Yeah, uh, Equality yeah. is, uh, well, it's not yeah. there, is it? No, it's not. You know, no. So it's a, it's a sad state of affairs, but um, hopefully we'll small interventions yeah. and small kind of movements yeah. um, will uh, capture people's imagination. As they did, we, as, we shall continue. As they did at yeah. the time, yeah. yeah, so what can we learn from them? Um, I had a fascinating <laughs> chat with you, Natty Mark, it's been oh, really nice. You. So oh, yeah, uh, big respect. A like, oh, huge, huge body of knowledge in this room, this library, uh, in the African school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're in Birmingham, you're doing things in London, mm -hmm. you're kind of hopping around the country kind yeah. of, spreading messages, um, positive messages, and getting people excited and enthusiastic about black history. Thanks so much for being part of the Science Ideas Festival this year. Thank you. Thanks everyone for watching, and we'll see you again. Thank you. Bye.